Aaron O'Toole, Jennifer O'Connell, and Jamie Schmale re-elected. Dan Kearns, local journalism initiative reporter for The Standard. North Durham, Kawartha. After a short federal election campaign, residents of three local ridings have decided to re-elect their representatives. On Monday, September 20th, Jamie Schmale, Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock, Aaron O'Toole, Durham, and Jennifer O'Connell were all declared elected. With 261 out of 262 polls reported, Conservative candidate Jamie Schmale won his riding with a total of 33,826 votes, which is 53% of the votes tallied. Mr. Schmale had over 19,000 more votes as of press time than his nearest competitor, Liberal candidate Judy Forbes. On election night, Mr. Schmale reflected on what it was like campaigning during a pandemic. It was definitely a different experience campaigning during a pandemic. Obviously, there were a lot more protocols and safety procedures to follow. But we were able to knock on well over 10,000 doors, and I think most people were quite happy that people were trying to reach out to them and get their thoughts and see where they landed on certain issues. Obviously, at the beginning, I thought the election was unnecessary. Having said that, we're into it now. On the last day, we had a lot to say about the issues, and I think it was a fairly well-run campaign on all sides locally, he said. Mr. Schmale noted the issue of access to high-speed internet as a concern he hopes to tackle with the next government. As always, access to reliable high-speed internet remains probably the number one concern. We've always known high-speed internet was a problem before the pandemic. More people are working from home during and after it, putting a strain on the existing capacity. Clearly, we need to get more people hooked up faster. He added jobs in the economy as other things he wants to focus on. In a close race in the Pickering-Uxbridge riding, Liberal candidate Jennifer O'Connell has been declared re-elected. With 155 of the 161 polls reported, Ms. O'Connell has 25,204 votes, over 5,500 more than Conservative candidate Jacob Mantle. The current leader of the Conservative Party and Durham's longtime MP, Aaron O'Toole, will also be returning to Ottawa. With 216 of the 217 polls reported, Mr. O'Toole was declared elected with 30,443 votes, 11,000 more than Liberal challenger Jonathan Giancroce. Tonight, Canadians did not give Mr. Trudeau the majority mandate he wanted. In fact, Canadians sent him back with another minority at the cost of $600 million and deeper divisions in our great country, Mr. O'Toole told supporters in Oshawa. Overall, Canada is headed for another Liberal minority government. Brock Township and Region of Durham continue working on supportive housing issue. Dan Kearns, local journalism initiative reporter for The Standard. Brock, Durham. The Township of Brock and the Region of Durham have made some progress regarding Beaverton's planned supportive housing development. Following a meeting earlier this month between the two sides at the Ontario Land Tribunal, the Township released a statement about the proceedings. The Region of Durham has agreed with the Township's position that the site plan process for 91 Nine Mile Road should not be finalized until such a time as the interim control bylaw process has been completed and the ultimate land uses for the lands are determined. Therefore, the site plan appeal and the Township's motion for an adjournment of the site plan appeal was settled on the basis that the site plan will be modified after the land uses are finally settled, following completion of the planning study. The statement read. If it is determined that the land uses do not permit the uses proposed by the region, then the site plan will not be approved. In November, councillors voted to pass an interim control bylaw to prohibit the establishment of supportive housing and modular construction, including manufactured dwelling houses, for a period of 12 months in order to allow for the appropriate completion of further research and consultation. This blocked further progress by the region on the 50-unit supportive housing development. Residents are reminded that the Beaverton Supportive Housing Project is still in planning stages and not approved at this time. Ongoing discussions between solicitors representing both the region of Durham and Brock Township will continue, and when appropriate, Brock Council will provide updates to the public without prejudicing either party, the Township Statement concluded. Small Plane Crashes into Lake Scugog. Dan Kearns, local journalism initiative reporter for The Standard. Scugog. 
An investigation began after a small plane crashed into Lake Scugog in Port Perry on Wednesday, September 15th. The incident occurred around 1 p.m. A Durham Regional Police, DRPS, spokesperson could only confirm that two pilots survived the crash, citing the fact Transport Canada is handling the investigation. At the time, North Division officers, as well as those from DRPS Marine Unit, responded to the incident. In a statement, Transportation Safety Board, TSB, spokesperson Dean Campbell, said the TSB has been informed of the occurrence and is gathering information while determining what their next steps will be. Kawartha Lakes counselors hear overall financial picture as budget process begins. Dan Kearns, local journalism initiative reporter for The Standard. Kawartha Lakes. City of Kawartha Lakes Council has started discussing the 2022 municipal budget. On Tuesday, September 14th, a special council meeting was held to start the annual budget process. This is council's opportunity to ask questions and provide direction. This is a high-level overview of departments, what they did this year, what the pressures are going into next year, and an overview of the whole budget process, Mayor Andy Latham explained at the beginning of the meeting. Treasurer Carolyn Danes said the municipality has spent over $5 million of just over $7 million the city received in safe restart pandemic funding from the province in 2020 and 2021. This leaves $1.5 million of that funding remaining for operating expenses related to the pandemic. We do have some expenses proposed in the 2022 budget to come out of that money. So after you take out that, we're probably at about $1 million left to spend on the safe restart funding. I don't think there will be any more pandemic money coming in, Ms. Danes added. The treasurer told councillors the city has about $510,000 remaining of the 2019 municipal surplus funds, totaling over $3 million. The surplus funds were used for community and economic recovery purposes, and the Fenland Falls Road Reconstruction Project. The city is also projecting another surplus for 2021. I projected out and determined there would be a surplus for 2021. However, that is dependent on the winter control season, Ms. Dane stated. If we have the same expenditures as in 2020, in 2021, we will have a surplus in winter control again. However, if we have the same winter we had in 2019, we would probably be closer to breaking even in winter control. 2019's winter was worse than 2020. Ms. Danes added the city is also concerned about workers' compensation expenses being over budget and a potential shortfall in arena revenue. In 2022, city staff are targeting a 3% tax levy increase and a 1.5% dedicated capital levy. We need to take every opportunity to protect the people we love. Part 1 by Tina Y. Gerber Looking after my mother while she suffered from dementia and Parkinson's has been very challenging. It was the right time to place her in the dementia wing of a local nursing home. This was the toughest thing my sister and I have ever done. You try to do all the relevant research, visit homes, ask questions, trusting you've done all the right and loving things a devoted child can be expected to do while trying to keep your loved ones safe and protect their well-being and dignity. We were blessed Mother still had lucid moments, and we cherished those connections. I am writing about my mother's death, which occurred while she was living in a long-term care home in Kawartha Lakes. Writing this allows me to not only grieve, but make her life matter, giving her a voice through my words, stepping up and making a difference for others. I desperately want the world to know my mother was more than just another statistic, as to ensure others don't experience the harm and suffering my mother experienced. It is our belief this incident could have been prevented. It is always a learning curve when one must realize their main source of learning and support would soon expire, leaving me and my sister orphans. My mother was living with Parkinson's and dementia. It was like losing a piece of her daily, but to have her die senselessly is unbearable. We will always have the minutes and the moments to recount her smiles, the lessons we learned, and the love we shared for one another. Truly a blessing in this crazy world. After providing care to my mother in her retirement residence, she came to live with us. Mother and I were able to connect and rediscover who we were separately and together. Our relationship flourished, bringing us a greater and deeper connection, 
which also allowed for many adventures of learning and love. I worked in long-term care, LTC, and have been a personal support worker for 21 years, but since my knee injury, I began working as a restorative care aide. Unfortunately, my mother died a few days before my retirement, so I was unable to have her there for this. LTC homes often promote the idea your loved ones can expect many more hours of nursing and personal care than typically in a retirement home. I strongly disagree with this idea. I have worked in both. As mentioned on the news, they do not receive 15 minutes of care when short-staffed or when new staff or agency staff work. These are those who do not know or haven't gotten familiar with your loved one's care routine or their care plan. How can a senior receive, in many cases, only 15 minutes of care a day and call that sufficient in either retirement or long-term care? Within LTC homes, the residents are still expected to share dining rooms, TV rooms, and other living areas within the facilities. They have a very limited space to call their own after a lifetime of helping, caring, loving, and providing for others. Long-term care homes are intended to be a place where mainly senior adults reside in comfort and safety as they head into their golden years. However, more and more long-term care facilities are facing an influx of younger individuals who have no other place to live. This influx of a younger generation is loudly and actively demanding their needs be met, leaving the less vocal to be overlooked, as they are unable to articulate their needs as clearly. LTC homes are a place where individuals can live and receive help. They have access to 24-hour nursing and personal care for all the activities of daily living, ADLs. Many nursing homes claim on-site supervision or monitoring will ensure your loved one's safety and well-being. Sadly, this has not been our experience in my mother's LTC home. My mother is now dead due to a preventable accident which should never have happened. Her case is now under investigation. We are waiting for the coroner's results and the conclusion of the autopsy. It may be weeks before we have conclusive results which will confirm the cause of mother's death. A Toronto coroner is investigating my mother's death and has called in a detective. The detective will lead his own investigation into the senseless death of our mother. My family never wants to see another loved one permanently injured or die as a result of what we view as negligence and inadequate staffing. It is our belief she is dead because of a lack of supervision, period. She was not protected, as she should have been, from abuse. Another resident assaulted her in her home several days before her death. She was left unattended, afraid, unprotected from another person with dementia while staff were off performing some duties, leaving a common area unprotected, all because of what all nursing homes say is lack of funding. We understand this individual is not of sound mind and are not holding them accountable. So who is accountable? I have observed other residents wandering around, unaware of what is happening. Often they are unsupervised, and I myself have rung for staff assistance to deal with a fight between two individuals. Another time, a gentleman had fallen but got up without staff awareness. One gentleman had his head smashed through a plate glass window. The list goes on and on, with many events my sister and I both witnessed. In my opinion, in my opinion, management neglected to meet mother's needs and provide for her well-being. By God's grace, I do not blame the staff on her unit. The nurses, personal support workers, and activation staff attempt to cope to the best of their abilities. From my experienced, considered opinion, the bottom line is management, whether in government-run homes or homes for profit, not enough is being done to protect our vulnerable population. Part 2, next week. The Standard Podcast was produced by Greenstream Studio for The Standard Newspaper.